consultant and lecturer of cardiothoracic anesthesia at Alexandria University and um, anesthesia department at Freeman Hospital in United Kingdom. And he is going to lecture on management of thoracic aortic disease and aneurysms. Welcome. So thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Barba, for the nice introduction. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Saad, and the, all the panelists for this great opportunity. So today I'm going to touch the anesthetic management of thoracic aortic diseases. And um, I'll try to touch the basis and uh, the uh, uh, try to be um, like as much as possible to cover the, the topic, which is a huge one. Um, so we, the introduction, we all know that arterial diseases are either coronary artery diseases, peripheral arterial diseases, or aortic diseases. Aortic diseases are aortic aneurysms, acute aortic syndromes, uh, with its types we're going to discuss later, atherosclerotic diseases, inflammatory affections, genetic diseases such as Marfan syndrome, congenital abnormalities, which includes the coarctation of the aorta and the bicuspid aortic valve. Um, what's the magnitude of this problem here? Recently, overall global death rate from aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection increased from 2.49 per 100,000 to 2.78 per 100,000 inhabitants between 1990 and 2010. And this burden increases in age with age and in men as well. Treatment should be, uh, in these cases, directed to, towards new modalities, which are now uh, approaching like aortic clinics, which are uh, uh, patients should go to the aortic clinics, which are highly specialized in these uh, diseases, which have uh, as well multidisciplinary team, which are responsible for these patients. And uh, uh, um, uh, it goes without saying that the hospital volume outcome relationship is important to the more the cases they do from the aortic surgeries, the more the uh, uh, better the results. And these are also referred as aortic teams. So aortic clinics and aortic teams are now important. So uh, if we look at this case scenario, 65 years old man with a history of smoking, hypertension, presenting to sharp tearing pain for the past 24 hours, also complaining of worsening cough, wheezing, dyspnea over the last three hours. How to approach this patient? And what's your anesthetic plan? Preoperative assessment, optimization, interoperative management, with minimizing the risks and the adverse outcomes and the post-operative plan are the three important things. Uh, we are going to discuss this in uh, a guide of the following guidelines, 2014 European Society guidelines and 2010 American Heart Association guidelines as well for the thoracic aortic diseases management. We should always refer to this, which is the level of evidence with the class of evidence and the level of evidence and uh, we have, this is very important in our uh, uh, discussion as well. Um, what are the anesthetic considerations for the uh, uh, case of the thoracic aortic surgical patients? So the pre-anesthetic assessment here is very important. What's the urgency of this operation? And what is the pathology? And what the anatomic extent of the disease? Uh, are we going to approach median sternotomy or thoracotomy? Is it the mediastinal effect happening for these patients is the compression and the sinus syndrome, for example, is there any way compression or deviation which is affected before uh, uh, going to surgery? And um, uh, we should also touch the uh, pre-existing or associated medical conditions and review them very well. So if there's a pre an aortic valve disease or not, cardiac tamponading, coronary artery stenosis, cardiomyopathy and heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, pulmonary disease with the affection of the either the pulmonary bronchioles, bronchi, or the lung itself, which will affect the post-operative course and the intraoperative course as well. Renal insufficiency is very important. And uh, uh, esophageal disease, if there's any contraindications to using the TOE, which is one of the cornerstones stones of the management. Coagulopathy is very important because these patients may need uh, spinal uh, CSF drainage uh, introducing spinal catheters, and uh, there are difficult managed, uh, management prolonged bypass, time, hypothermia, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, and this all will affect the relation of the patient. So if this patient is starting with a capillopathy or a liver hit or liver dysfunction, this will be affect our this will be affecting our management and uh, will be difficult to manage as well. 
Um, and any prior, prior aortic operation is the redo operation, which is more difficult always. Is this patients or any medications such as warfarin, antiplated therapy, antihypertensive therapy uh, before the surgery? And we usually find this very complicated picture of this patient in theater, lots of things, um, uh, 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 nears, transosophageal echo, swine guns, uh, lions coming from all types of the patients. And, and we don't see the back of the patient here. There's always the spinal drainage catheter and the other uh, monitors that we use for these patients. So we, we always use, we almost use all the monitors that we know. What's the anesthetic management? So hemodynamic monitoring here to start with is very important. We should use a proximal aortic pressure line in, in, either in the, right, in the right hand. And then distal aortic pressure line if it is distant to the procedure known. So we have to discuss the procedure with the surgeon and know what's the procedure going to be and what type or what part of the aorta is going to be operated upon. Central venous pressure is very important if this patient is uh, uh, tamponading, and if this patient uh, it reflects the right atrial pressure and uh, its, its, its central venous pressure is very important if we are, we are using retrograde uh, uh, cerebral perfusion as well. Pulmonary artery pressure, cardiac output, especially in the inter post bypass and in the, in the post operative uh, period management, TOE is the cornerstone. Neurophysiological monitoring that, such as EEG, somatosensory evoked potential, motor evoked potentials. Uh, jugular venous oxygen saturation, which has now NIRS has replaced it almost, and lumbar cerebrospinal fluid pressure and body temperature as well. We may use double lumen endotracheal tube or bronchial blockers for one lung ventilation to facilitate the operative field and facilitate the surgery uh, uh, as well, and this will lead to better dissection and less complications. Uh, potentiality for bleeding should use large bore intravenous cannulas, blood products all available. For us, antifibrinolytic therapy should be available. So we can mostly we use a protein infusion from the beginning of these cases uh, till the end of these cases as well. And um, uh, uh, this is uh, a very important. Uh, and the antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, these patients are very liable to uh, infection. Uh, Post-operative care and the complications are, all, are always the same. Hypothermia, hypotension, hypertension, bleeding, spinal cord ischemia, which is very important. It should monitor for 48 hours uh, post-intervention, stroke and renal insufficiency, respiratory insufficiency, phrenic nerve injury, and the diaphragmatic dysfunction. And these both are very important because these patients uh, may uh, be difficult to win from ventilator and the, the main cause may be these injuries to the diaphragm or to the phrenic nerve and may need tracheostomy and long-term management in the ICU. Um, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, sometimes we find patients, we already see them in the preoperative period uh, assessment, our preoperative assessment, and after a couple of hours in the OR, we saw them that they start to be hoarseness, have hoarseness in their voice, and we should expect that there's a bleeding uh, aneurysm, for example, compression on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So whatever, whenever you have this recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, hoarseness of voice, you should suspect that there is uh, uh, pressure on this from uh, the aortic side. Pain management is very important as well. And so what, what are the medical management appropriate for these patients? Always you have to target these patients not to uh, have further further deterioration of the pathology. So for dissecting aneurysm, well-controlled blood pressure, decreased the contractility is very important. Leaking aneurysm, same hemodynamic principles as dissecting aneurysm. So we should decrease the heart rate, decrease the blood pressure. And with this, we usually use beta blockers as the first line and plus or minus vasodilators, but don't ever use vasodilators on their own for hypertension with, uh, because this leads to reflex tachycardia and uh, uh, further deterioration of the patient. Ruptured aneurysm is a special entity, needs a volume resuscitation and emergency surgery. Uh, median sternotomy versus sarcotomy. Aortic disease is proximal to the left carotid artery, has usually median sternotomy, and disease is distal to this point, left thoracotomy or thoracoabdominal uh, incision. Uh, surgeries of the aorta are either emergency, urgent, elective or reoperation, emergency surgeries in dissection, rupture aneurysm, traumatic injury, urgent as subacute dissection, expanding aneurysm, and elective stable 
aortic aneurysm, which is called the chronic aortic aneurysm, coarctation of the aorta, and atherosclerotic diseases, which uh, is progressive uh, reoperation on bioprostatic valve, which is, is a failure, graft failure, progression from one stage operation to a second stage operation, example in elephant trunk, frozen elephant trunk operations, pseudo aneurysm is the, is the uh, reoperation as well. Uh, uh, anatomy is very important. We have to understand the relations to the aorta, the ascending aorta, and the arch and the descending, and the special emphasis on the pulmonary trunk here, uh, which is very important next to the uh, aorta. And this may cause compression if there is any aneurysm or any compression on this pulmonary artery. And as well, the right main bronchus is very important, which can be uh, uh, compressed as well, and the left atrium. Uh, anteriorly, there is the, the, the pulmonary trunk in of the right uh, 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 ventricle as well. Uh, abdominal aorta, we, you should always know the uh, level of the uh, surgery and what extent. And if you're using an endograft or a stent, are we covering the celiac trunk level T12, super, superior mesenteric L1, and uh, 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 renal arteries are very important. And if we are covering these uh, arteries, we should always uh, either uh, do reimplantation or fenestrated stents or whatever, endo uh, permit some endoleak because this will, will be uh, hypoperfused and will go into ischemia. Um, spinal cord arterial supply is very important. It's uh, uh, anterior spinal artery is a single artery and it originates from the uh, uh, bilateral uh, vertebral artery. So the left subclavian, right subclavian are very important, which gives the which gives the vertebral arteries. So if we are covering the left subclavian artery, this will uh, cause a big problem. Left subclavian artery give big problem uh, if uh, uh, um, this spinal artery is compromised. And uh, for the posterior, this covers the anterior to third of the spinal cord. And this, the posterior spinal artery covers the posterior third, originating either from the vertebral arteries as well or posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. And these are two posterior spinal arteries. The very important is the segmental arteries. These segmental arteries are end arteries. And whenever we compromise the segmental arteries, cover them with stents or do much of a dissection during surgery, these are compromised and these are end arteries which affect the spinal cord massively. And they are branches of deep cervical, ascending cervical, intercostal and lumbar arteries. Uh, the one important artery is the artery of Adam Kvich, uh, or the arteria magna, which arises between T9 and T12, uh, sometimes uh, distal to this, uh, but it's very important because it is. It also uh, uh, anastomosis has anastomosis with the anterior spinal artery, uh, and it supplies the anterior part of the spinal cord, distal part of the uh, spinal cord. Um, uh, histologically, we should know that the aorta is endothelial or entima media, muscles, adventitia, which are connective tissue. We all know this. Uh, we start with the aortic aneurysm as one entity uh, and the first entity. What's the aortic aneurysm? Uh, it is definition. It's the dilatation of the aorta, which contains all the three layers of the vessel wall. So as we said, all these three layers should be dilated. Whenever they have the dilatation of the three layers, it is an aortic aneurysm. So what is a pseudo aneurysm? Pseudo aneurysm is not that. It's not all layers are dilated. There is localized dilatation, not all three layers, and contains clots, and it is contained by connective tissue surrounding the aorta, and uh, this is usually caused by contained rupture of the aorta, intimal disruptions, penetrating atheromas, or partial dehiscence of a suture line. And this is very important and dangerous as well, and they may lead to reoperation. What are the causes of aortic aneurysm? Atherosclerotic, aortic dissection, collagen vascular disease, as Marfan's syndrome and Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Marfan's is well established now in the guidelines and has its own entity with dealing with the far Marfan's and uh, the dilatation of the uh, aorta and the uh, uh, dissection and aneurysms. But Ehlers Danlos is still not as uh, established as the Marfan's in terms of the guidelines. Trauma, cystic medical degeneration, infectious as bacterial, viral, spirochete, syphilitic, fungal, and inflammatory as takayasu arthritis and the polyarthritis. And we uh, can see some of these inflammatory diseases affecting the aorta, causing ulcers, causing uh, uh, um, uh, a dissection uh, as well. 
the shape of these aortic aneurysms, these aortic aneurysms are either secular, uh, as we see here, this is the secular part or fusiform. The most common is the fusiform, and it is associated with the atherosclerotic or collagen disease, and usually longer segment. Secular, small segment, and it is confined to the isolated segment of the aorta. What are the symptoms of the aneurysm? Chest back pain caused by dissection, rupture, or bony erosion, mass effect on the thoracic aneurysm, which, I, as I mentioned before, the current laryngeal hoarseness of voice, trachea, main stem, bronchus, pulmonary artery, dyspnea, and uh, 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 superior vena cava syndrome, which showed increased central venous pressure, esophagus, which shows dysphagia. And if there is any rupture, uh, we the, uh, see the rupture of the thoracic aortic aneurysm as a surgical emergency, go volume recitation, resuscitation and uh, immediate surgery. Acute pain may be the result with or without hypotension. Rupture of the ascending aneurysm may cause tamponade and rupture in the descending thoracic aorta may cause hemothorax, aortobronchial fistula or aortoesophageal fistula. Whenever the patient have hematemesis or have hemoptysis, this is very dangerous uh, sign as well. Uh, complications of the thoracic aneurysms are rupture, aortic regurgitation, tracheobronchial esophageal uh, compression, right pulmonary artery, right ventricular outflow obstruction. This is very important. Sometimes it causes compression of the pulmonary artery or right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we don't know what is the cause. We can find this in the uh, TOE. We can find it in measuring pressures. And um, we should know that the right pulmonary, right ventricular outflow uh, can be affected for mass compression. And uh, especially uh, in these patients, it's very uh, uh, important. Systemic embolism from any neural thrombus is a complication of thoracic aortic uh, aneurysm as well. Um, what are the interventions of the thoracic aortic aneurysms that are recommended by the guidelines from the European uh, Society of Cardiology? Uh, surgery is indicated in patients with Marfan syndrome if the uh, aortic root uh, aneurysm with a maximum aortic diameter is more than or equal to 50 millimeters. Uh, this is uh, 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 class 1C. And surgery should be considered in patients who have aortic root aneurysm with maximum ascending aortic root diameter, more than 45 in Marfan, more than 50 in bicuspid, and more than 55 in patients with no elastopathy. Uh, the, import, the one important things as well in these guidelines is the surgery should be considered in patients who have isolated aortic arch aneurysm with a maximal diameter of more than 50 millimeter. This is in the uh, aortic arch, more than 50 millimeters. Uh, on the descending aorta, we can see that the thoracic endovascular aortic uh, uh, repair, which is the TVAR, should be considered rather than surgery when anatomy is suitable. TVAR should be considered in patients who have descending aortic aneurysm with maximum diameter more than 55. And if TVAR is not available in the institution, we should target 60 millimeter or more to go to surgery because surgery is more difficult with more complications and more morbidity and mortality. When intervention is indicated in cases of Marfan or other elastopathies, surgery could be indicated rather than TVAR. So if, we, if the patient is Marfan or has elastopathy, surgery is better than the TVAR. What would do with the surgical repair of this ascending aortic and the arch aneurysm? It's also guided by the TOE. So we can measure the aortic valve diameter. We can measure the uh, uh, sinus, a diameter, the uh, 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 sino uh, 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 junction between the sinuses and the ascending aorta and the uh, ascending aorta. And according to the affection of these diameters, we'll decide the type of surgery uh, upon the uh, diameter. Perioperative TEE is very important for this, as we said. You either do surgery only for the ascending aorta, or can you include the root of the aorta, the root of the aorta, which is the sinus till the sinoid junction. Um, uh, what type of surgery here? So if the aortic valve is not involved, we can, and the ascending aorta is only involved, we can replace the uh, ascending aorta with a tube graft uh, only. But if the aortic valve is diseased, the, uh, 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 but the sinuses of Valsalva, which is the aortic root, are normal, and, and aortic valve replacement combined with tube graft for the ascending aorta. But if all are involved, this is a, 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 requires root replacement. Um, 
this is very important. You can, you can see this severe dilatation of the root here. So this is the by sinus diameter of the aortic diameter, which is enlarged in this patient and the ascending uh, aortic as well. Um, aortic root replacement, which is the modified pintel procedure. We, we all hear about the modified pintel. And with this, we replace the aortic root and we do reimplantation of the coronaries uh, 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 plus or minus the valve uh, replacement in the aortic valve. Uh, if this uh, pathology extends to the aortic arch, this uh, will take us to the repairing the aneurysm with uh, uh, um, deep hypothermic, you can you, you use deep hypothermic circulatory arrest with perfusion adjuvants such as selective perfusion of the innominate or of the uh, left common carotid. And this is one example of operation which is called the elef elephant trunk repair uh, operation with the involvement of the aortic arch uh, in this patient. Um, we can see different types of grafts here. So tube, tube, tube graft with uh, 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 trifurcated uh, uh, branches, which is a branch with, uh, from this tube graft arising from it. And then we can connect the uh, left common carotid and the left subclavian to the same uh, graft, which replaces the innominate. So it is a trifurcated tube. Uh, uh, graft and it is replacing here part of the uh, uh, arch of the aorta and this distal part is another part of the surgery which is a uh, um, frozen elephant trunk for this patient uh, and its extension of the dissection into the distal part of the thoracic arch and the aorta. Um, very important here are the surgical techniques in the aortic disease. What we should use according to the guidelines. These three arrows represent the most important for the anesthesis. CSF drainage is recommended in surgery of the thoracoabdominal aorta to reduce the risk of paraplegia. Very high instance of paraplegia in these surgeries. Uh, selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion, which is selective perfusion or anti-grade cerebral perfusion, should be considered in aortic arch surgery to reduce the risk of stroke. This is 2A as well. And left heart bypass should be considered during repair of descending aorta or the thoracoabdominal aorta to ensure distal organ perfusion. And this is 2A uh, uh, as well. Uh, we then uh, touch the anesthetic management for the ascending aorta and the arch aneurysms. The imaging studies should be reviewed before surgery in an MDT with the surgeons and see if there is any compression of any mediastinal structure, such as the right pulmonary artery, the left main bronchus, this will affect our intubation, will affect our ventilation, and will affect our measurements. And even the TOE, sometimes we put the TOE in the esophagus, and when we try to push it into the stomach, it stops. Just because this is a very diluted, huge aneurysm that is compressing the esophagus, so in, in, in this patient, just stop. Don't cause any harm to the patient by pushing the TUE. You shouldn't obtain the, 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 the transgastric views in, at that point. If you feel any resistance, you already passed in the esophagus and you have the esophageal views, you can use them, okay? Don't push the TUE at that point. It will cause rupture of aneurysm. Prevention of hypertension increases the, uh, it's very important, so increases the forward flow in case of aortic regurg, minimizes the risk of aneurysm rupture as well, uh, we should have a proximal and distal aortic uh, arterial management, uh, either in the right radial artery. And if, but if we are using uh, selective perfusion to the innominate artery or the axillary artery, we should obtain a left uh, radial artery or a femoral artery, so distal to the uh, perfusion to know the distal perfusion pressures on bypass. If arterial cannulation. Uh, of the axillary subclavian or innominate, we said that we should do uh, uh, opposite uh, uh, cannulation. Uh, very important is the temperature, nasopharyngeal, tympanic, bladder temperatures, uh, important for the brain and the comp for the maintenance of the core temperature and the conduction of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. TOE is very, very important. It guides you, assess the surgical intervention, guides the plan, confirms diagnosis, guides the plan, and monitor the outcome. In patients with AR, it is very important in the delivery of cardioplegia if we do retrograde cardioplegia cannula. Uh, T is reasonable in thoracic aortic procedures, which includes endovascular intervention. It's very important if you 
want to guide the guide wire uh, during the uh, uh, TVAR procedures uh, uh, to use the TOE and ensure that this guide wire is in the true lumen, not in the false lumen. Because if you put the guide wire, you put the sheath, you put this tent in the false lumen and you deploy the uh, uh, thing, you will uh, uh, end with rupture of the aorta and sudden death. Uh, neural protection is very important. Brain protection here, what are the important things that we do for neural protection. Deep systemic hypothermia is important. Topical cerebral cooling, usually the surgeons believe in topical cerebral cooling more than us, to be honest, but we still do the topical cerebral cooling, okay? Retrograde cerebral perfusion and uh, 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 selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion and cerebral hypothermia at any point should be avoided uh, uh, during rewarming. Uh, what's the deep hypothermic circulatory arrest? We should maintain the median nasopharyngeal temperature at around 18. Best is 12 or 12.5 degrees centigrade to produce silence uh, EEG picture. But 18 is a median nasopharyngeal median temperature with good suppression. Uh, very high uh, uh, silence uh, production in, in, in a high pro uh, number of patients. Nasopharyngeal temperature 12.5 is the best. and either 12.5 or cooling the patient for 15 minutes achieved 99.5% of the cases. So this is very important, but it has its drawbacks, coagulopathies, organ perfusions, and uh, uh, um, uh, other complications as well. And the thing, the second approach is the retrograde cerebral perfusion. Here, we just do uh, uh, infusing cold oxygenated blood in the superior vena cava, so retrograde, from the pump to the superior vena cava, and then going the brain in the opposite direction, from the superior vena cava to the internal jugular vein and to the opposite direction. And this is a temperature of eight degrees to 14 degrees via cardiopulmonary uh, bypass. And this is very important. And we should monitor the CVP at that point. It shouldn't be exceeding 25 centimeters. Uh, so is this a new terminology which has been introduced, which is the goal-directed cerebral perfusion. Goal-directed cerebral perfusion means anti-grade cerebral perfusion plus nearest monitoring or near-infrared spectroscopy monitoring. So selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion uh, and near-infrared spectroscopy together uh, is the goal-directed cerebral perfusion. Uh, what's the pharmacological neuroprotection? We know the thiopentone. Thiopentone at 15, we used to, when it was available, it was 15 to 20 milligrams per kilograms on bypass. And, and this can augment the 18 degrees uh, 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 patients, which are not yet in silent EEG and can augment them to the silent EEG stage. Propofol causes suppression and it doesn't cause silence and corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are established in the spinal cord protection, but they are controversial and they may cause harm in the uh, brain protection, especially if they cause hyperglycemia. Um, uh, what are the acute thoracic aortic syndromes? These are syndromes which are emergency conditions and have similar characteristics involving the aorta. There is a common pathway for all of them, which uh, initiates and it, it includes the breakdown of the intima and the media for all of them. This is the classification of the aortic, uh, acute aortic syndromes, class one, two, three, four, five. Class one is the aortic dissection with true lumen and the false lumen. And this is the entry point here. Class two is the intramural hematoma, which here. And uh, class three is the subtle or the discrete aortic dissection with bulging of part of the aorta. And the class four is the penetrating aortic ulcer, as we can see, it penetrates into the media here. And this is class five is the iatrogenic or traumatic aortic dissection, which is uh, we usually see in cath lab. Uh, this is a picture of the intramural hematoma, another picture of the atherosclerotic ulcer, which is penetrating or uh, 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 into the media here, and it may cause intermural hematoma, dissection, aneurysm, or rupture. Uh, and we all know that the, what happens in the aortic dissection is increased pressure at the intima, okay, from the entry point here, which cause tear, false lumen into the media that may propagate 
and it may, it may either come out again into the intima with a re-entry point. So this is an initial tear, and maybe there is a re-entry point here, or it may stay without a re-entry point. Uh, location 65% in three centimeter uh, uh, distance from the coronary ostia, 10% in the arch, 10% in the descending thoracic aorta. Um, what are the uh, uh, management of this acute aortic syndrome. So these patients come typically with acute chest pain. So we should manage this patient by seeing the patient, not what if it is a high risk patient for developing acute aortic syndrome or not. So what are the high risk conditions? High risk conditions are the Marfan syndrome, family history of aortic disease, known aortic valve disease, known thoracic aortic aneurysm, previous aortic manipulation, including cardiac surgery as well. High risk pain features, chest, back, abdomen, uh, abrupt onset, severe intensity, ripping or tearing pain, high risk examination findings, uh, evidence of perfusion deficit as a pulse deficit, systolic blood pressure difference, focal neurological uh, deficit uh, in conjunction with the pain, aortic diastolic murmur, which is new and with pain, which may signify acute aortic regurgitation, hypotension or shock, which may signify any bleeding in an aneurysm or dissection uh, as well. Uh, when we, what is this, uh, uh, the uh, algorithm for the acute chest pain? Take medical history of the patient, clinical examination, as we said, and ECG. If this patient is STEMI, see the ESC guidelines, which mention acute coronary syndrome. If not, see if the patient is hemodynamically stable or not. If unstable, start with strong thoracic echo. If you can see uh, a good diagnosis and confirmed, just go to the theater. If it is not confirmed, you should do 2UE or CT if the patient can reach the CT. Uh, and if it is excluded at this point, you should uh, uh, see another uh, uh, diagnosis. But if this patient is stable, here we have to go back to this slide. Is it high probability or low probability? High probability score two to three from the previous ones and uh, plus or minus typical chest pain. Um, typical chest pain, alone is okay, or this high probability score alone is okay. Low probability score zero to one. Uh, if this is a high probability score, due to thoracic as a beginning, definite aortic uh, uh, dissection, refer emergency to the surgical team, if this is not uh, the case here, and there is uh, uh, um, inconclusive, just go to CT or TOE, uh, if the patient is uh, unstable, or, or and then we can, can confirm our dissection or can uh, search for another diagnosis. If there is no probability, just to start with the less invasive things uh, or D dimers, for example, transthoracic echo, chest X ray, and combine the three of them in your results. D dimer is very important in the aortic dissection, especially shooting numbers in the first hour of the pain. If you have shooting numbers, very high numbers during the first hour after the pain, this is a very good uh, uh, guidance towards aortic aneurysm. Uh, if there is uh, uh, other uh, um, uh, investigations. Uh, so if D-dimer is negative, transthoracic negative, chest X-ray negative, no argument for this aortic uh, uh, dissection, consider another diagnosis. But if there are widened mediastima signs of uh, uh, aortic dissection from uh, transthoracic high D-dimers, go to CT and this patient should be stable, can do uh, uh, MRI or TOE as well. MRI we usually takes time and needs a more stable patients. Confirmed plan as well and not confirmed consider for another uh, uh, diagnosis. Uh, detailed imaging is very important to this patient. So you should visualize the intimal flap. Extent of this uh, uh, disease according to the anatomy for the plan of the surgery, plan of the anesthesia. Identification of the force and true lumens. Localization of the entry and re-entry tears, as we said, identification of anti-grade or retrograde dissection, uh, identification and the grading and the mechanism of aortic regurgitation is this valve is, 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 is healthy or not, involvement of side branches of the aorta, detection of any malperfusion in the mesenteric or vessels or in the celiac or in superior mesenteric, whatever, renal, this is very important, the brain as well. Detection of organ ischemia as brain, myocardium, bowels, kidneys. Uh, detection of pericardial effusion, if there is tamponade and severity. Detection extent of pleural effusion. Detection of aortic bleeding and the signs of mediastinal bleeding. 
all this in aortic dissection sh should we should have a, a, a modality that gives us all this information. If you cannot obtain it by CT, you should obtain it by TOE uh, uh, um, uh, in, before surgery or during surgery. Intermural hematoma is localization and extent to existing of atheroma, presence of small tears uh, uh, are very important as well. Uh, and this is a comparison from the guidelines between different types, transthoracic, transosophageal, CT, MRI, and autography. Uh, uh, for the ease of use, transthoracic, of course, bit sides, and, but for the accuracy, uh, reliability, TOE, CT, MRI, uh, and uh, for the follow-up, the best is the MRI in the serial examinations and in the wall visualization. CT is good as well for the and TOE in the aortic visualization, but the best for the follow-up is the MRI. This is an example of auto dissection by transthoracic echo. We can see the intimal flap here, uh, uh, for example, in this picture. And um, um, this is the transosophageal echo, the intimal flap, and the entry point. Uh, and this is the intimal flap as well, so, true lumen and, and uh, pseudo or, or false lumen. Uh, all these are examples intimal flap, intimal flap, and uh, uh, these are very important uh, uh, um, diagnostic tool and a follow-up as well. Uh, how to differentiate true lumen and false lumen? So the true lumen has pulsation, systolic expansion, uh, but the false lumen has systolic compression. Flow direction is anti-grade in the true lumen. It's anti-grade uh, uh, reduced or absent in the false lumen or even retrograde. Uh, communication flow, flow from the true to false lumen in systole, and this is very important. And the contrast echo flow is early and fast, which here is this delayed and slow. This is uh, always the true lumen is smaller than the false lumen, but you can see here, this is more sluggish in the flow, more brighter and may contain uh, 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 thrombus as well. This is a picture of the intramural hematoma here, and this is as well another one here. Uh, and this is the penetrating uh, ulcer in the aorta. So what's the classification of the aortic dissection accord? And we can localize it by this classification. The most important is the Stanford classification for these guidelines rely on the Stanford classification. Stanford says that we have type A and type B. Type A is localized or affecting the ascending aorta proximal to the uh, uh, um, uh, left subclavian, but type B is always distal to the left subclavian. But you have, you may have an origin of the entry point or a dissection here in the descending aorta, but it extends and involves the ascending. At that point, it is type A because it affects the ascending or the arch of the aorta. Okay, the bakey uh, as type one and type two and type three, and this. Uh, type A, type 2, sorry, is localized to the ascending aorta. Type 1 involves all the aorta, and the type B involves the aorta distal to the uh, left subclavian, and it's either at this level, proximal or distal. Um, what's the presentation? Chest pain, back pain, uh, migrating pain with the ingoing dissection, aortic regurg, tamponade, ischemia or infarction, heart failure, poor infusion, syncope. A major neurological deficit, spinal cord injury, mesenteric ischemia, acute renal failure, lower limb uh, uh, ischemia. The differential diagnosis is very important, and we said that when the investigation D-dimer is one of the very important uh, markers. There's also other new markers which result from the destruction of the aortic media, uh, but this is beyond the scope of our lecture. Uh, this is the importance of CT evaluation uh, in the uh, aneurysms. Uh, treatment of the aortic dissection. Here it is very important that the old patients with aortic dissection, medical therapy targets pain relief, blood pressure control. This is the first thing. In patients with aortic dissection, urgent surgery is recommended. In patients with acute aortic dissection or the malperfusion, we may do a hybrid approach, such as ascending aorta or arch replacement associated with any percutaneous TVAR, for example. In ample complicated type B, medical therapy is level 1C. In uncomplicated type B, TVAR should be considered as 2A. So we have two opinions with different levels of evidence for the type B. Type A, always surgery. Compl if this is uncomplicated, but in complicated type B, TVAR is recommended. And in complicated type B, surgery may be considered, but TVAR is 1C better. 
treatment of this uh, 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 dissection, it, uh, uh, according to the Stanford A, consider surgical emergency, and there is one percent of mortality per hour for the first 48 hours, so 50 percent mortality in two days. Uh, and despite improvements in surgical and aesthetic techniques, preoperative mortality and neurological complications are still 18 percent, neurological and mortality 25 percent. Um, Operating type A presenting with neurological deficits or coma is controversial. So if you can do it in the first five hours, you can. If not, it's very poor uh, prognosis. What are the types of surgery in the aortic root uh, dissection? This is, in the, if, there is, if we have aortic root dissection, we we'll either do a valve sparing technique uh, uh, as this one. So concept of valve sparing root uh, uh, repair, excision of the uh, disease the aorta and the isolation of the coronary arteries, but and also we may do reimplantation of the coronaries into the tube graft here, which is either David operation and the David operation has support of the annulus, or in the Jacob operation, which has no support of the uh, annulus. Uh, ascending aorta and aortic uh, arch surgery, and these are examples all of the types of the tube grafts here. Uh, in the uh, distal arch and in the uh, descending aorta, if you can, uh, 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 you know that the entry point is here in the descending aorta, you can use the two-staged uh, 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 hybrid, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, elephant trunk operation or the one-stage hybrid frozen elephant trunk operation. And uh, uh, you, at this point, you occlude the entry point uh, which will not affect the, your graft here uh, after the first operation. Uh, um, this is a patient which was 56 years old, may presented with subacute type B dissection. He was hypertensive, persistent chest pain, creatinine is 2.7. So this patient is considered unstable type B, as we said in the guidelines. And uh, 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 the term complicated or unstable means persistent uh, current pain, uncontrolled hypertension, malperfusion, which is the creatinine high. So this patient, continuous pain, creatinine high, is complicated. This is the two types of stent grafts that we use. And this is a case that we did already previously. It was a hybrid case with the virus and arch debranching from the neck uh, incision. So we did debranching from the neck uh, incision with the hybrid thing uh, uh, from the uh, femoral approach. Uh, this is the primary tear here in the CT. We can see that the CT tear is involving reaching the left common carotid. So if we put here, and this is the primary entry site. So the primary tear is here, but this is still there. And we should have a landing point of around two centimeters if we use the stent here. So we're putting the stent to cover this point. Until this point, we will occlude the left subclavian and the left common carotid. So what we did is that we opened for, so a neck incision and it did debranching of the uh, left subclavian and the left common carotid and uh, connected them with tube grafts to the innominate artery and uh, did the uh, TVAR from the distal side. So this is the complete picture of the CT with the dissection. What we did is to put the stent here, including the primary entry point and uh, 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 this false human will thrombose, and this is the picture here, uh, uh, left subclavian, and this is the left common carotid, and connected by tube graft to the innominate artery, and this is the stent here covering this part of the aorta. Uh, we did this case in Alexandria, so uh, we used all the uh, available things, so it was like uh, a monitors, the bis, the sorry, the uh, uh, nearest, the, if we see here that these the uh, left side of the brain, right side of the brain, and this was distally in the lower limbs, and this was the dissection of one of the iliac arteries, so this is lower than this in the reading. And this was after uh, uh, um, occluding the left side, we can find that it, it dropped on the left side for uh, some time, but still 58, which is fine. And this is after reperfusion again, it's almost equal again. Uh, using the TOE to define the entry point and to guide the processing of the guide wire and the caster to the true lumen. Uh, and this was the final part surgery, the tube graft uh, from the neck incision. 
uh, in a hybrid procedure. And this is the stentograft. This is the orthography in the cath lab. This is the branch here, and this is the uh, stentograft. And this is the whole length from the uh, inferior part. The last thing is the thoracoabdominal aneurysm. It's the, we should know that this is a Crawford classification for this, which it's either one, two, three, or four. It's either starts below the, sub below the subclavian artery origin and ends in the above the renal artery. This is one. Entire descending thoracic aorta up to the bifurcation two. Starts at distal thoracic aorta involving the abdominal aorta three. Confined to the upper abdominal aorta is four. Uh, and this is the figures here. Descending thoracic and thoracoabdominal aneurysms, the most important things that there is risks for spinal, mesenteric, renal, and lower extremity ischemia significantly due to the thromboembolism, loss of collateral vascular network of the spinal cord, as we said before, and temporary interruption of the blood flow. Uh, and these are the complications, cardiac, pulmonary, hemorrhage, acute renal failure, paraplegia, uh, and in-hospital mortality with the thoracoabdominal aneurysm. This is the position. This is the position, the direction of the aorta, uh, uh, the course of the aorta, I mean. And the position is usually 30 degrees in the hips, 60 degrees in the shoulders, a thoracoabdominal aneurysm, which is extensive one. Uh, we use certain maneuvers to perfuse the distal parts. It's either we use the uh, uh, left heart bypass for the thoracic and thoracoabdominal replacement, and we use this from the example from the ascending aorta or from the bypass to the distal part of the body, bypassing from the pulmonary veins, for example, with the left heart bypass from the part left from the pulmonary veins to the distal parts or any of the arteries in the distal abdominal or, uh, or thoracic aorta. Uh, this is a left heart bypass as well. And we uh, here is using thoracic and thoracic abdominal replacement with selective visceral perfusion and there is selective bilateral cold saline, inf cold saline infusion of the kidneys. This is another maneuver to protect the kidneys as well. So all the arteries, left renal, celiac, superior mesenteric, right renal, all of these arteries should be uh, either perfused or protected. Um, we may use retrocentric evoked potential for the spinal cord, motor evoked potential, nearest lumbar CSF pressure, body temperature. And this is a picture of the loss of the uh, motor and, uh, potential. And this is loss of the somatocentric evoked potential. So this is the normal course. And this is here, the stoppage or the abrupt. And this is the abrupt stop as well in the somatocentric. This monitor the dorsal colon. This monitor the anterior part of the cord, and this should be without any muscle relaxant in the motor one. Uh, 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 spinal cord is very important, blood supply, perfusion pressure, reperfusion injury, critical intercostal uh, artery coverage. So if, the, if we are covering a large area of the aorta, the more incidence of the spinal cord injury we have. At this point, we should either use fenestrated stents, we, use, we should use uh, a bi a bifurcated stents and anastomosis with the uh, these branches, or we may allow some endoleak inside the uh, uh, stents to just to perfuse from around to these arteries. Uh, collateral circulation of the spinal cord and the hypotension, avoid hypotension in the first 48 hours, in, especially in the ICU. We, we usually forget this in the ICU. There is always spinal CSF drainage and avoiding hypotension, blood pressure above 80 in the ICU for first 48 hours to protect the spinal cord. This is another method to uh, uh, monitor the collateral circulation uh, here of the spinal cord with the nearest as well on the paravertebral uh, planes. And this is to the areas of anastomosis that may be affected. Hypotension, we mentioned this and uh, and re-implantation of the vessels, all of them. If you can re-implant the vessels, re-implant. CSF drainage is very important uh, 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 in this part. And this is the endoleak that we can permit for five to 10 days. And then we can use the amplazer to close these endoleaks later on when we are sure that there is no paraplegia and no affection of the spinal cord. CSF drainage is very important. You should ensure that there is no agulopathies and it's maintained for 48 hours, you should monitor this. Pressure should be less than 10 to 12 millimeter mercury at all time. Take home message. You should know about the aortic clinics, aortic teams, acute chest pain algorithm, 
pre-assessment, there should be MDT, patient involvement, always think A, B, C, D, E, F, G, a pre, inter, and the post-operatively, follow the guidelines, and uh, future is for the cath lab and the hyper procedures uh, uh, as well. Uh, thank you very much. Barbara? Thank you um, so much, Dr. Hashim. Um, let me see what kind of questions we have from the audience. Um, here's a question from the audience. It says, is the silent EEG and birth suppression the same thing or are they different? Well, they are different uh, and they are not the same thing. We can obtain silent EEG with hypothermia or deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, or we can uh, uh, um, obtain this with the thiopental sodium as well. So the only drug uh, uh, which is similar to the hypothermia in producing the silent, silent EEG is the um, um, uh, thiopental. So first suppression is different and it's less protective uh, uh, for the brain than the silent EEG, uh, definitely. Thank you. Um, are there some more questions from the audience, please? Sorry. I, I think the audience enjoyed the lecture too much and uh, because the lecture is very uh, informative and uh, is delivered in a fantastic way by Prof. Amr Hashim. Uh, what do you want to add, uh, Barbara, if you want to add, if you want to ask anything yourself? Sure, I will ask a question. Um, in your institution, do you place the CSF drains or does a surgeon? No, we do the CSF drainage. We usually do the CSF drainage. We can use the uh, um, special catheters for the spinal catheters that we use, uh, and we put them on monitors, uh, monitoring the CSF pressures, uh, the same as the CVP measurements. And uh, these these uh, special catheters will allow the drainage as well. Uh, we usually start with draining like 20 mils these patients even with the low pressures and we just monitor after that for 48 hours. Do you normally um, drain a certain amount each hour or do you wait until a certain pressure is reached? Um, it's better to wait for, it's, uh, it's two different schools to be honest. So there are school which says every hour you have to take like 10 to 20 mils of CSF and this is better even if the pressures are uh, fine, because it's always about the perfusion pressure of the spinal cord, the difference between the mean arterial blood pressure and the uh, 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 CV uh, and the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. So you you cannot always ensure that you have, your map is very is is a great map and the perfusion pressure is 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 very good. So this like uh, routine or uh, sequential uh, uh, draining is better. Uh, others show just go by the. Uh, pressures measurements and uh, uh, um, we we usually uh, uh, go by the the, the uh, monitoring of the pressure uh, uh, measurements unless there is a, um, a definite sign of paraplegia or affection of the limbs. Okay, um, and here's a question from the audience. Um, the audience asks, uh, "What is your target blood pressure?" Target blood pressure for the spinal cord should be above 80 to, uh, to ensure that there is a good mean, map, mean arterial blood pressure above 80. Okay. Here's another question from the audience. It says, um, uh, doctor, please mention your fluid regimen and your analgesics uh, post-operatively, please. Because in our institution, they use the, uh, uh, either the uh, IV opioids infusion which is the either fentanyl or alfentanyl infusion uh, for these patients. And uh, uh, we usually avoid regional techniques because of the coagulopathies and the uh, uh, different, the, uh, with this ble these patients bleed like hell, especially the thoraco abdominal patients requires like massive blood transfusion, massive products. You cannot uh, rely on any regional uh, 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 block for these patients. So usually use the IV uh, opioids uh, infusion for these patients. And the, uh, the paracetamol uh, is, 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 is usually 
uh, we give paracetamol as well. And uh, then uh, uh, these patients on the second day, we us usually put them on PCAs, uh, PCA morphine or PCA fentanyl, uh, and then start weaning the continuous infusion relying on the PCA and then the oral uh, opioids uh, thereafter uh, in combination with the uh, paracetamol. And we can may give gabapentin and other drugs which if, if, if there's no contraindication for the new for the new neuropathic pain. Wonderful. Um, the, the, the next question from the audience was basically the same. They were asking if you use PCA, which you, you said you do use PCA. Yeah, yeah, we um, do. Let me see if there's another audience question here. Um, here's an audience question. Um, any contraindications for the CSF catheter in patients with pre-existing uh, coagulopathies? In these patients with the pre-existing coagulopathies, it's very difficult to put a CSF catheter. And if this patient can be corrected uh, preoperatively, it is better if you can give any time. If it is emergency, we can do nothing and we should avoid it. But if there is a possibility uh, for a correction of the coagulopathy, if patient is on warfarin and he's a chronic patient and maybe stable, we can give periplex or a prothrombin uh, complexes for these patients and reverse it. So it's better always to use it, but if you can't use it, it's, 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 uh, it, uh, it, uh, the, the, the paraplegia incidence is very high uh, in these patients with extensive uh, manipulation of the uh, blood supply of the spinal cord. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions from the audience, please? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ashim. That was a wonderful, wonderful, informative lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you much, everybody. Today, uh, we have another milestone, uh, a great lecture by Prof. Ansari and his series in intensive care and another very, very informative lecture by Prof. Amr Hashim. His first day today with us, and we hopefully will see him again in another uh, series of open heart anesthesia. And uh, wonderful moderation by Barbara Roger from Ohio. And thank you very much for coming today. And hopefully we'll see you again, thank all you. our colleagues and attendees. Uh, happy Eid. And uh, next Sunday and the following Thursday, we, uh, sorry, next Thursday and the following Sunday, we are off. And we see you all on Sunday, su Thursday, 6th of August. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Happy Eid. Thank you. Thank you.